So I think we're about to see something on the level of Epstein, Weinstein, to the power of 10. From members of the royal family to Grammy and Academy Award winners, we're breaking down all the A-list celebrities named in court docs against P. Diddy, along with some startling accusations. First of all, that, that entire filing was just gasp worthy. I'm not seeing a scenario where he can escape liability, criminal liability. He's been known for years as a renowned rapper, producer, and label executive who goes by the names P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, or his legal name, Sean Combs. Whatever name you want to call him, he's no stranger to legal troubles. Just this week, both Diddy's homes in Miami and Los Angeles were raided by Homeland Security. According to former prosecutor Melba Pearson, they're likely looking for some specific evidence. The feds are doing raids at three different homes of P. Diddy, including his homes in California, in Florida, and in New York. And what I think they're looking for are videos. So basically, P. Diddy had a habit, allegedly, based on told to us through the filings by uh, Cassie Ventura. They have all said that he had a habit of liking to video either him abusing other people or in, you know, forcing other people to abuse each other for his pleasure and I would record all of that. So I think those are some of the things that the feds are looking for. I think they're looking for other types of evidence to corroborate the statements that were made by Little Rod, by Cassie Ventura, and the other people have come forward saying that he did abuse them. So they're looking for corroborating evidence and all the basically the building blocks to put together what will end up being a massive, massive, massive criminal case. So far, Diddy hasn't been arrested, but he has already faced his fair share of legal issues. Last year, Diddy's ex-girlfriend, Cassandra Ventura, who you probably know as singer Cassie, accused him of sex trafficking and sexual slavery. She alleged that Diddy raped her and beat her so severely that she was bruised. Cassie also alleged Diddy made her have sex with prostitutes and recorded it on video. She also says he forced her to carry a gun. Cassie sued him under New York's Adult Survivors Act and settled with Diddy outside of court just one day after the suit was filed. Joy Dickerson Neal also filed suit against Diddy under the Adult Survivors Act, accusing him of drugging and sexually assaulting her back in 1991 when she was a college student at Syracuse University. Diddy was slammed with yet another lawsuit last month, this time brought on by music producer Rodney Jones, also known as Lil Rod. The 73-page lawsuit lays out dozens of allegations against Diddy, including that he forced Lil Rod to hire prostitutes and have sex with them. The court doc also claims Diddy himself assaulted Lil Rod, but that's not the only bombshell allegations revealed in the detailed documents. Lil Rod doesn't shy away from publicly naming other celebrities he says assaulted him. I don't know that Cooper Gooding Jr. is going to escape from that one. Let's start with the allegations against Academy Award winning actor Cuba Gooding Jr. Lil Rod alleges Diddy was, quote, grooming him to pass him off to his friends. This fear became reality when Mr. Combs introduced Mr. Jones to Cuba Gooding Jr. when they were on Mr. Combs' yacht. There's actually photos of their interaction together too, which are laid out in those court documents. In the first pic, you see Diddy and Cuba talking with Diddy's arms on Cuba's. In the next pic, Cuba has his arm around Lil Rod and is smirking. Court docs go on to state, quote, Cuba Gooding Jr. began touching, groping, and fondling Mr. Jones' legs, his inner thighs near his groin, the small of his back near his buttocks, and his shoulders. He rejected his advances, and Mr. Gooding Jr. did not stop until Mr. Jones forcibly pushed him away. In the last couple of years, there were allegations against him for sexual assault. So now we had those prior allegations, and now we see him tied to this case as allegedly uh, trying to, you know, uh, assault a little bud, assault others. Back in 2019, Cuba was booked on misdemeanor charges of forcible touching and sexual abuse after he allegedly groped a woman in Times Square. By the next year, three women had come forward, accusing him of non-consensual sexual touching. He eventually reached a deal with prosecutors that required six months of counseling, but no jail time. I, I'm getting the feeling where there's smoke, there's fire. 
right? Because now we have two different instances where you're accused of the same type of behavior, you know, years apart. I, I think there's something there. And I don't know that Cooper Gooding Jr. is going to escape from that one because he already saw definitely people moving away from him within Hollywood circles and other circles once those first sexual assault allegations came out. So at this point, I don't think he's going to get, get away with it a second time. Is it possible that he could face charges based on these allegations that were brought forward by Lil Rod? It is possible as well. Um, again, we've got the statute of limitations issue to deal with. So depending on the time frame of when this happened is, you know, again, the Adult Survivors Act, which was the vehicle where many of these lawsuits came out, many of these civil lawsuits, excuse me, came out, there, there was a finite amount of time for those suits to be filed. The time frame is going to be very, very important. Uh, what witnesses come forward, because again, you know, this this may not be a situation where DNA be, may be at play. This may be more of a situation of, hey, yes, I was there and I re recall, you know, uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., you know, putting his hands on the rod or I, re you know, recall certain aspects. So it's going to be a very witness intensive type of case. And the question is, will the witnesses be willing to come forward? Lil Rod's lawsuit also publicly named another celebrity linked to Diddy. Jennifer Lopez. From the, the standpoint of the, the names of the celebrities that were tied to this, the fact that Jennifer Lopez was tied to this back when she was involved in a or party to a shooting at a nightclub when she was dating Diddy and is now alleged to have brought the gun with, with her to the scene and gave it to Diddy and that's how the shooting occurred. Lil Rod's team brings up J-Lo when establishing Diddy's history writing his quote, Rico Enterprise has existed for at least 20 years, dating back to the 1999 nightclub shooting in NYC, when Mr. Combs required his then girlfriend, Jennifer Lopez, to transport his illegal firearm into the NYC nightclub. The court docs allege Diddy forced his then artist, Shine, to assume responsibility for the shooting of several individuals. All this happened back on December 27, 1999, when a fight broke out at a nightclub. Diddy, J-Lo, and rapper Shine were all there, and according to former rapper Mark Curry, Diddy paid Shine $1 million to take the fall for the shooting and serve a 10-year prison sentence. Lil Rod's lawsuit now suggests it was J-Lo who brought the gun. The fact that she's named as somebody who was carrying a weapon, could that be incriminating for Jennifer Lopez? It can be, um, but with a, with a huge caveat, right? Um, if I'm not mistaken, that shooting did not result in a death. I know that somebody was harmed, but I don't believe anyone was killed. Because of that, you had the statute of limitations to deal with, which is basically a prolonged amount of, uh, a certain amount of time that a prosecutor has to be able to bring charges against someone. And it, it varies from state to state, but the one thing is consistent is that there is no statute of limitations on murder. So if P. Diddy had actually killed this person or the person died as a result of their injuries, now J-Lo could be brought into the mix as a co-defendant because of the fact that the person has passed away. But if the person is alive and maybe they had serious injuries or whatever the case may be, statute of limitations would run and it is highly likely at this juncture that statute of limitations have expired, therefore she does not have any criminal liability. But the reputational damage might be a different story because now she's branding herself as something very different than who she was back then. Back then she was very much on Jenny from the block. She was, you know, dating a variety of hip hop artists. She was very much in that world. Now she's married to Ben Affleck. She's trying to, you know, portray herself in a different manner. So now her past is going to come back to haunt her. And we don't know what that's going to mean for her future in terms of movie deals, music deals, or anything like that. So I think for her, it might be more reputational damage than criminal liability. Pearson says it's possible Jennifer Lopez could file some sort of defamation suit, but it's not likely. She could, but at the end of the day, when it comes to defamation in those types of cases, truth is an absolute defense. So if he has some sort of receipts to basically prove that, hey, I, I was right there. I saw her the same way in the filings. You saw a number of different screenshots and pictures that he submitted to support the different 
points that he was making. If he has some pictures to substantiate that she was carrying the gun, it, it, it's going to be very hard for her to say in good conscience in a court of law that, you know, this wasn't true. He's made this up. And now as a result, I've lost, you know, money. I've lost opportunities and things like that. There's going to be too much evidence out there connecting her to this that is going to be very hard for a jury to come back and say, yeah, he's making all of this up. But it's not just artists that Lil Rod named either. He specifically mentioned Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, in his court documents. It reads in part, quote, Mr. Combs was known for throwing the best parties, affiliation with and or sponsorship of Mr. Combs' sex trafficking parties garnered legitimacy and access to political figures, artists, musicians, and international dignitaries like British royal Prince Harry. Why even name Prince Harry? There's no allegations against him or anything, but why bring him up? I think it may have been a move to bring more credibility to the filing and say that, you know, basically he was using, he being Diddy, was using his fame, fortune, and influence to insulate himself. So he was able to legitimize some of the activities he was doing by having these lavish parties bringing all these A-list celebrities, but somewhere in a back room or somewhere in, in another wing, you know, horrible things were happening. So the fact that Prince Harry was there does not necessarily mean he was participating in what was happening. And just because you were at a party doesn't mean you know what's happening in every inch of the house. I mean, if you think about it, if the party is being thrown in a mansion, there are various floors and wings. So it is completely possible that he was there and did not participate. Now, if you had said Prince Andrew, especially as a result of the allegations that came out in connection with the Epstein case that they were close and that they traveled together and you know there was a person that alleged that he had um had sexually assaulted her while she was underage that would be a different story but prince harry and the way that it was mentioned seemed to be very again just sort of trying to bring legitimacy and talk about these were the people that he that did he surrounded himself by to protect himself so Prince Harry has no formal accusations against him, but the name association could cause damage to his reputation. Even so, Pearson says it's not likely he files any sort of defamation suit. It's possible that Prince Harry may be able to preserve his reputation. But again, just in light of everything him and the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, have been through, I... I Truly, really hope that, you know, he's able to completely distance himself, maybe make a statement, because again, since he's not necessarily under the uh, umbrella of the royal family directly, that, so in other words, Buckingham Palace would not be releasing a statement on his behalf. It would be him releasing a statement and saying, yes, I went to X party, but no, I never engaged in any inappropriate behavior or other details that he may see fit to share. Um, so that's going to be, you know, we're going to have to wait and see on that one. But again, since it was such a minuscule mention in the con greater context of this filing, he may be okay. Pearson compares Prince Harry's association with that of President Bill Clinton, who'd been seen with Jeffrey Epstein before his arrest. And there didn't seem to be much said around him actually engaging in activities more that he was present at the parties. So I don't recall seeing a lot of fallout uh, on the part of President Clinton from that association. Speaking of Epstein, Lil Rod's court docs draw a parallel between Diddy's alleged crimes and Jeffrey Epstein's. Epstein died by suicide back in 2019 when he faced numerous charges of sexual assault over the course of multiple years. His longtime companion, Ghislaine Maxwell, was charged and found guilty of sex trafficking in relation to her time with Epstein. She's currently serving out a lengthy prison sentence. Lil Rod compares Diddy's chief of staff, Christina Cahorum, to Ghislaine Maxwell, saying she ordered sex workers and prostitutes for Mr. Combs and ordered and distributed ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, and mushrooms to Mr. Combs and his celebrity guests who were present on his rented yacht and in his homes in LA, NYC, and Miami. Under these cases, when you have these high profile people that have been using people over years, these cases happen without a handle. 
R. Kelly had a handler, you know, uh, Epstein had a handler, Weinstein had, had, had a handler. Everybody has in those scenarios of those powerful people, powerful men that are abusing other people, they have someone that does their dirty work. And it's usually not only just one person, it's several people who may have different duties. So again, you know, seeing this this woman being his handler, being the person to get him drugs, being the person to, to uh, procure sex workers for him, being the person to basically be on cleanup duty in case of, you know, covering up or silencing people that might want to come forward, you know, that that that's not unusual. And she is also going to bear the brunt of criminal liability, just like Jillian Maxwell did and basically had to take the entire brunt of the criminal justice system alone because of the fact that, you know, um, Epstein committed suicide and was not able to be held accountable. And According to Pearson, Diddy and many of his associates will likely face federal charges, but it's not totally clear when. And what do you think a timetable would look like for all of that? I know that there's a lot of evidence to gather over many years, but is it possible that a federal indictment could be just around the corner? I would hesitate to say just around the corner because with all of the experience I've had with his office approaches cases, they do not move until they have you fully, like they have you dead to rights, basically. So they are going to take their time. They're going to collect all the evidence. They're going to speak to as many witnesses as they can. They're going to follow every single trail, every single lead that they can before they go to an indictment. There can be continuances. There can be other things that can delay the case. But once you file that charging document, the clock starts ticking. So that, you know, when I was a prosecutor, I always advised my detectives, anybody that I was training, that you get all the evidence you can up front, and then you file charges. So when is it possible that we would actually see him being arrested or facing any of these indictments? Could it be months down the line? I feel that it would be months down the line. I, I would not be surprised if it was before the end of this year. Because um, again, this is going to be a massive investigation involving at least three states, much as we saw in the uh, in the Epstein case, where he was bringing underage girls to uh, one of his islands in the Caribbean. And there have been some allegations of things happening on planes, things happening on trips. So there may be additional locations that may need to be searched and additional witnesses that may need, need to be spoken to in order to get a full picture for what charges would be appropriate and what would be the best path forward with this case. And it's possible Diddy serves a lengthy prison sentence for all this if he were to be convicted in criminal court. If this does happen, that P. Diddy is indicted. I know in R. Kelly, we saw quite a large sentence for him. What could P. Diddy be facing if he is convicted of eventual indictments? Yeah, well, it all depends on what charges are brought and how many counts of each charge is brought, right? Because for each, uh, for, for each, charge is usually one victim or survivor attached to that charge. So if, he, if, if the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office is able to pull together 15 survivors, right, and they're willing to come forward and testify, you may see 15 counts. So the question will be, if he's convicted, will all those counts run concurrently, meaning at the same time, or would they all be consecutive? And if it's consecutive, he could be looking at, at life plus, right? Um, if they're run concurrently, again, depending on, on the universe of what is charged, you know, he, he's going to be looking at a prison sentence if convicted. There, there's going to be no way around that. Is there any possibility that he walks away clean from this, that everything is dropped and he faces no charges or any prison time? Not impossible. I mean, anything is possible. But I, I don't see that happening. I see him kind of going the path of R. Kelly, where again, for so many decades, he was able to act with impunity and just, you know, with harming so many, uh, you know, young women. But eventually he had to pay the piper. And eventually he ended up with a prison sentence. So I, that in this juncture, from what's been publicly available, from reading Little Rod's filing, 
from re reading and hearing about the horrible things that Cassie Ventura endured during her nearly a decade relationship with him that started when she was a young woman, I, 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 I'm not seeing a scenario where he can escape liability, criminal liability. I'm, I'm just not seeing it. It's possible, but I'm not seeing it. In a statement, Diddy's attorney, Sean Hawley, denies all of Lil Rod's allegations. He writes, quote, his reckless name dropping about events that are pure fiction and simply did not happen is nothing more than a transparent attempt to garner headlines. We have overwhelming, indisputable proof that his claims are complete lies. Diddy's son, Justin Combs, is also mentioned in the lawsuit. A statement released from him reads in part, quote, Justin Combs categorically denies these absurd allegations. They are all lies. This is a clear example of a desperate person taking desperate measures in hopes of a payday. There will be legal consequences for all defamatory statements made about the Combs family. So far, we have not heard a comment from Cuba Gooding Jr. And as of now, P. Diddy has not been arrested and does not face any criminal charges. Reporting for Law & Crime, I'm Sierra Gillespie. All right, uh, take a look at this. A brand new video showing the aftermath of Monday's raids on the LA and Miami homes of music mogul Sean Diddy Combs as part of an ongoing federal human trafficking investigation. Our next guest previously defended Mr. Combs in 2015, where serious felony charges were dropped. Attorney Mark Ergos joins us live right now. Mark, good morning to you. Good morning to you, too. So, what do you think's going on? Well, I think clearly the feds have uh, taken notice of the kind of raft of lawsuits that have been filed. They're using those as a roadmap. And uh, my, the cynic in me would say that they aren't getting witnesses cooperating the way they want. And so this is a great way to kind of uh, deliver a shock and awe uh, uh, message to anybody connected with Sean that this is uh, we're serious and we're coming after him and you better cooperate or you're going to be left in the wake. By by the way, this is almost warp speed when it comes to the feds in terms of when they open an investigation and when they do this kind of a search. Right. And Marcus, you know, this particular unit that uh, did the raids, they're in charge of human trafficking crimes. So it, do you connect those two? Yes, I, uh, I don't think that there's any doubt in my mind, at least, that uh, that their homeland security is leading the charge here and that the right. allegations would seem to mirror uh, exactly what has been alleged in a couple of these lawsuits. Right. So, like I... Uh, I've said before, and I, I, they've taken a look at the lawsuits. They're using that as a roadmap, and, and they're uh, engaging in this kind of activity to claim to want to freeze his, his electronics. I think his lawyer, and I think you mentioned you may have the statement, I think I his do. lawyer came back and has complained bitterly about it. Well, uh, perfect transition. Let me read the uh, attorney's a statement they say yesterday there was a gross overuse of military level force as search warrants were executed at Mr. Combs' residences. There is no excuse for the excessive show of force and hostility exhibited by authorities or the way his children and employees were treated. Mr. Combs was never detained but spoke to and cooperated with authorities. Despite media speculation, neither Mr. Combs nor any family members have been arrested, nor has his ability to travel been restricted in any way. This unprecedented ambush paired with an advanced coordinated media presence leads to a premature rush to judgment of Mr. Combs and is nothing more than a witch hunt based on meritless accusations made in civil lawsuits. There has been no finding of criminal or civil liability with any of these allegations. Mr. Combs is innocent and will continue to fight every day to clear his name. To, and in that, uh, Mark, the lawyer does mention these uh, other lawsuits, and, er, and you, rather, you mentioned uh, one of the lawsuits. One of them came, I believe it was last November, uh, and it was Sean Combs's former girlfriend, Cassie, who, among other things, alleged rape and things like that. That was settled, I think, within a day or two after filing it, but it had to do with the deadline, didn't it? Yes, the, New York had this kind of unique look-back statute 
the Adult Sexual Survivors Act on the eve of that expiring. The lawsuit was, uh, they mediated it and then settled it right on the eve of that expiration. That kind of triggered some of these other lawsuits that also jumped on right after the fact. But I think his lawyers got a point. And it's obvious, at least to anybody who does this for a living, that those were kind of the uh, the scripts from which the uh, the Department of right. Justice is singing on these lawsuits. In addition to representing Sean Combs, uh, you also, back in the day, represented uh, Lyle and Eric Menendez, who are the subject of a brand new Fox Nation special called Victims or Villains. Here's a snippet where a juror talks about the defense. Testimony of all the family members for the defense um, made a huge impression upon me that they were supporting Lyle and Eric. As soon as Jose took either one of the boys into their room, the door was locked behind him. And Mark, uh, you're part of this special, but one of the things you have been talking about is these rulings, these convictions should be overturned because they should argue they defended themselves in self-defense. Yeah, what happened here is in the first trial, uh, they had two separate juries, uh, one for Lyle, one for Eric. Those juries overwhelmingly found it was not a murder case, it was a manslaughter case, but they were hung. Mm -hmm. Then they did a second trial. What happened in between is O.J. Simpson was, was acquitted. Eight days later, after the acquittal of O.J.'s, they start picking this jury. There was all kinds of pressure on the D.A. to get a conviction, to win the big one, because they had a success of losses for anybody who remembers right. that era back in the 90s oh, in yeah. L.A. So the pressure was there. The judge, I believe, succumbed to that pressure and changed the rules in the middle of the trial. He kind of pulled the rug out from under the defense. I didn't try that case. It was very ably tried by Leslie Abramson. And they ended up getting sentenced to life without parole. Right. The interesting thing is, if these had been the Menendez sisters, I don't believe for a second they would still be in custody. Wow. Folks, check out this special on uh, Fox Nation. It is called Menendez Brothers Victims or Villains, featuring Mr. Garagos. Thank you, sir. Who better to talk about the high-profile case of Sean Diddy Combs than the attorney who's represented some very high-profile celebrities like Bill Cosby and Meek Mill? Brian J. McMonagall gives his take and advice for Diddy. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. So we have been talking to a lot of people about the latest developments in the Sean Diddy Combs story. More specifically, I mean that federal agents raided properties connected to the rapper this past Monday. It's being reported this is all in connection to an ongoing sex trafficking investigation. Not clear if Combs is a target or subject of the investigation. Certain outlets are reporting that Combs is the target. Now, remember, target is essentially the person that prosecutors have evidence against that they're building a criminal case against. It's also being reported that the search was pursuant to a search warrant issued through the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. Homeland Security were the ones who carried out the raid. NBC News reported that several people have been interviewed by federal authorities in connection to allegations of sex trafficking, sexual assault, solicitation, distribution of illegal narcotics and firearms. This comes on the heels of several high-profile lawsuits filed against Mr. Combs and his family and businesses and associates, alleging everything from sex trafficking to sexual assault to harassment. If you read the details of these lawsuits, you can't unhear them. You can't unsee them. It is just horrific stuff. And it is being reported that this search on the properties was for documents, electronic devices like phones, computers. It was a wild scene where you saw agents swarming onto the property, sometimes with guns drawn. We saw video of several people, including potentially Combs' sons in handcuffs. Seems like they were detained, not arrested. Now, at the time of this recording, it is not even clear where Combs is at this time. But we do know that neither he nor anyone else has been arrested or charged or indicted in connection with this operation. However, a man named Brendan Paul, someone who is alleged to be Combs' drug mule, was arrested on cocaine and marijuana possession. This was charges out in Florida. He's been bailed out. 
His attorney released a statement, quote, We do not plan on trying this case in the media. All issues will be dealt with in court. This was a statement from Brian Bieber, his attorney, that was issued to CNN. Okay, so with all that in mind, I want to bring on a special guest. I want to bring on right now attorney Brian J. McMonagall. He represents some very high-profile people, rapper Meek Mill, Bill Cosby. So he is no stranger to these situations where high-profile people face very serious uh, accusations, allegations. They're in the spotlight. They're in the media. And I was so happy to get your perspective on this, Brian. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Um, so I got to just get your overall take on what happened here. Um, I will tell you, first of all, we've talked about before the air. We've done stories on Diddy. I was maybe not one of the people that was that shocked when this came down because we were reporting on lawsuits where he was accused of sex trafficking and sexual assault. But But to see... What happened the other day? What was your reaction to it? Uh, I was shocked. Um, I, you know, they didn't, they didn't just come heavy. They came nuclear. Um, seeing the kind of federal response you saw at the execution of those warrants was stunning. Uh, it, it looked like they were hitting El Chapo's house um, when I saw it on the news. And uh, I had the same reaction. I mean, I, I had been looking at it and hearing the allegations and, and studying some of the lawsuits, but I never thought it would rise to the level of federal intervention, particularly at that level. Um, so uh, stunned. Um, and my initial thoughts were twofold. One is that they're very close to indicting somebody, or two, they had some really hard intel that told them they had to move quickly so they could discover evidence that uh, their information was indicating was was either uh, located at one of these residents, uh, but it was stunning in terms of the swiftness and the, the breadth of it, I must tell you. Mm. Well, listen, I, I wanted your perspective, too, because fresh off the presses yesterday, late yesterday, uh, Diddy's attorney, he's now rep being represented by Aaron Dyer, released a very long statement on the rapper's behalf. As a defense attorney, I'm curious your perspective on it. So it says, quote, Yesterday, there was a gross overuse of military-level force as search warrants were executed at Mr. Combs' residences. There is no excuse for the excessive show of force and hostility exhibited by authorities or the way his children and employees were treated. Mr. Combs was never detained, but spoke to and cooperated with authorities. Despite media speculation, neither Mr. Combs nor any of his family members have been arrested, nor has their ability to travel been restricted in any way. This unprecedented ambush, paired with an advanced, coordinated media presence, leads to a premature rush to judgment of Mr. Combs and is nothing more than a witch hunt based on meritless accusations made in civil lawsuits. There has been no finding of criminal or civil liability with any of these allegations. Mr. Combs is innocent and will continue to fight every single day to clear his name. What are your thoughts on that? Perfection. Um, you know, he's obviously represented by a great lawyer, and that's the exact response that you want. Um, this is an indication um, from... Uh, the defendant, uh, if he is going to be a defendant, that they're not messing around, that they're not going to um, lie down. It's unequivocal. It's I'm innocent. And if you've got something, bring it. I don't know that you could have crafted a better statement. And I think it's an indication of, of what's to come, because if they are going to bring charges, this is a case that's going to go to trial. Well, that's my question. So when they say that he cooperated, there was a lot of talk, a lot of early speculation that Diddy ha had left the country, that, you know, he escaped. Uh, doesn't appear to be the case. Um, but what does it mean that he cooperated with them? Um, do you think he had advance notice of what was happening uh, at his home? Do you think he was informed right when it was happening? Um, what What do you think it means by he cooperated? I, I don't know that you could read much into that. Um, okay. You know, co cooperation takes on a couple of different meanings. Uh, cooperation could, could mean that he's already met with law enforcement. I don't think that he has. Cooperation could mean that he's cooperating with law enforcement. I don't think that he has. I think this was a statement by his lawyer basically saying, hey, listen, we're not going anywhere. We'll face these charges. Um, if somebody needs access to, to dwellings or records, they can issue subpoenas. You don't have to come, you know, with the, the strike force here. If you need information or if you need evidence, we've got it. And we, we look forward to cooperating with an investigation that will clear my client's good name. And I think that's the only way you can read that. Talk to me about 
though, if this gives you any indication about where Diddy is. For, for in the, when I say that is, you know, there was a question of did he leave the country, right? It seems to me if he's somehow cooperating and, and maybe uh, gave up electronic devices that he would still be in the country. Does that, you think that's a fair assessment? You know, it, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, if he had some pre-existing plans, um, you know, it wouldn't be surprising. You know, a guy with that lifestyle could be anywhere. But um, I would think it would make sense for, for everybody, if he's not in the country, for him to get back in the country quickly. Um, any important matter in your life deserves your attention. Um, if I was advising him, I'd be advising him to, to come back home. Uh, to hold his chin up and to get ready um, to deal with what's coming. Uh, it's probably going to start raining soon for him, and he's going to want to make sure that um, he makes it clear to everybody he's got nothing to run from and that he won't run from anything. So if he's not in the country, I would expect in short order he will be back in the country um, uh, without question. Unless he went to a country that doesn't have an extradition policy. But, uh, <laughs> but, right. yeah. but, but let me ask you this. Is yeah, that, that usually doesn't work out too well. Oh no! I mean, again, people were like, yeah. "Oh my gosh, if he knew this was the heat was on, I mean, he's just going to go somewhere where he doesn't have yeah. to come back." But you, you don't suspect yeah. that's what the case is. Yeah, it's a small world. I, I've had some people try that; it doesn't usually work out too well. Let me ask you this: the idea, and and you are echoing, I think, uh, what a lot of other attorneys, legal analysts have said that it seems charges are about to come down. Now, I will tell you, a lot of people have said that they thought that with a raid, there would be an indictment in conjunction with it. People would be arrested. We haven't seen that. It's been, at the time of this recording, two days since the raid. Um, a, are you surprised we haven't seen arrests uh, in connection with this, again, what is a purported sex trafficking investigation? Uh, and do you think charges are going to come? Um, on the first question, uh, I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, you know, they, they usually do it one of two ways. They'll either... Um, come heavy and indict immediately, or they're coming heavy to try and secure evidence so they can start a process of putting evidence before a grand jury. I mean, we don't even know if there has been any evidence presented to a grand jury yet. Um, they're, they're the feds. They're not the state courts, and they are not going to indict somebody or charge somebody on somebody's word alone, I can assure you. And so they want to try and develop as much evidence, uh, forensic evidence, um, you know, they're going to be looking at phones, they're going to be looking at travel, they're going to be looking at corroborating every allegation that's been made in these lawsuits. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they took their time um, because uh, they know that they're going to get the best representation in, in the world uh, for this celebrity and um, they're not going to look to want to lose. And so, you know, they're very interesting in, in how they operate the feds, you know. So I think trying to read too much into timing could be problematic, particularly if they didn't find anything. I mean, what, what did these searches yield? Did they get any evidence? Is there anything um, that they obtained that would, would make them run before a grand jury and bring charges? Um, you know, I, I think they're going to take their time uh, unless they've got it. And I'd be surprised if they have it yet couple of things there, right? So we know that you would need probable cause for a search warrant. Um, they did show quite the presence. Now, you could say, and I'm based on, I'm reading the, the lawsuits, right? And you, you read, if you take the allegations in the lawsuits, it's true that Diddy is surrounded by weapons, that uh, he has a, a quite the security presence, large properties. You don't know what you're entering into. I've spoken to law enforcement experts who say it's not surprising they came with that level of uh, you know military reinforcements, or they talked about a military grade, but but at the same time, um, you know the way that they did it w was was quite a statement, and to not have it be in conjunction with other charges at the moment, um, you say you know it could have been that it, it, there was reporting that they had been speaking to certain individuals. Again, with the belief is that this is emanating from the Southern District of New York, the U.S. Attorneys for the Southern District of New York, but. It seems don't do you feel that they had more than just statements from witnesses to go after these properties or to go into these properties like that? Yeah, there's no doubt that they had something that that uh, you know kind of suggested a clear and present danger or something that suggested to them that there was going to be real evidence there that could be destroyed. Um, I, I don't think they would have came in the way they came without some hard intel, um, and so. 
I mean, that it tells me one of two things. It, it tells me that they're getting real information about criminal activity, whether it's true or not, who, who the heck knows, that criminal activity is ongoing. Otherwise, they wouldn't have came the way they came without an indictment. Um, but I, I just think it's always um, – you need to be cautious in terms of, of trying to understand their mindset. Um, I don't know what drove those warrants. I don't know what that probable cause was. And I think that will tell us everything once those warrants get unsealed and, and charges emanate. Um, but, you know, they can always charge a couple of different ways in a federal case. You can charge by an information or you can charge by a grand jury indictment. They've done neither here. Um, and I think they were hoping to find something. And whether they found it or not, I don't know. But I didn't get a sense of that. By the way, as I cover stories like this, I always think about what are some ways we can protect ourselves in this absolutely crazy world? You know what one of the best things you can do is? Learn about who you surround yourself with. Yeah, and you can do that with truthfinder.com. There are great sponsor. Always so happy to talk about them because Truthfinder is one of the largest public record search services in the whole world. Their goal is to help people like you learn the facts about the people in their lives. Here's how it works. You go on the website, truthfinder.com, and you type in a name. I'll make it really simple. You type in my name, Jesse Weber, okay? Type in my name. Within minutes, you get access to reports that include information like phone numbers, addresses, associates, criminal convictions. No, I don't have any of those. Were you expecting something else? No, I don't have them. But you know what's really useful? Is if you type in an address, like your home address or where you work, it tells you the registered sex offenders that may live in that area too. Yeah, and that's the point. Unless you use Truthfinder, you may never know the reality about the people around you. And I'll tell you this, honestly, once I started with this website, I couldn't get off of it. I started typing in like everybody's names I could think of. I must have spent a straight half hour going through it. It was absolutely fascinating studying the people in my life. And right now, you can get 50% off of confidential background reports. You just go to truthfinder.com slash LC sidebar. Hope you check it out. Do you think the civil lawsuits have an effect on this? But what, what do I mean by that? I mean, we both know that um, if, even if you sure. settle a lawsuit, like Cassie Ventura was one of his accusers, settled within the day after filing that uh, sexual assault lawsuit, she accused him of rape, really horrible, horrible, horrendous things, settles with him. She could be cooperating with law enforcement. Do you think, I mean, again, I just think the timing of this, after lawsuit, after lawsuit, after lawsuit, after lawsuit, the, one of the latest ones is the one from uh, his former producer, a uh, little Rod Jones. I have to feel that that has an effect on what's going on here. No, I don't think there's any doubt about it. I mean, I, I you know, I don't believe in like you know consecutive lightning strikes, and so I think that's exactly what's driving it. Um, and you know how this goes. I mean, one witness, uh, two witnesses, but a multitude of witnesses will get the attention of law enforcement. Um, but this is a federal investigation, and it's you know this isn't just a sexual assault allegation like we see in the state courts. This is a trafficking investigation, and so um, the kind of um, investigation that usually follows that kind of investigation is lengthy. Um, it's detailed, um, and I'd be surprised if they rushed into something here. Uh, that's just not how the feds operate. Um, so they did come heavy. They sent a clear signal that they're coming. Um, but how quickly you'll see charges, um, I think, remains to be seen. I'd be stunned if they move too quickly on this. That's just not, that's just not who they are. By the way, I, I have to ask, I mean, one of the big questions is, is, if this is true, okay, let's just assume the worst here. Was this just like a, a known secret that nobody came out? Was it a situation, you know, like maybe uh, someone was afraid to come forward? I mean, we talked about it so much with other cases, right? R. Kelly, Jeffrey Epstein. But big question I keep getting asked uh, uh, is if this is true, is this just what was going on and nobody spoke up and nobody said anything? Was this just like part of the, the hip hop world? I mean, because it's a really, you read the allegations in these lawsuits, it is next level. Yeah, it, it's hard to imagine that, that this could be going on with, with the world not knowing. There's always too many people involved. There's, there's a lot of money and you can spend a lot of money keeping keeping people quiet if there's criminal activity. But it would be stunning to me if all of these allegations are true and and everybody put their head in the sand. It's just 
unimaginable to me, quite frankly, because everybody's looking for an angle. Everybody's looking to make a buck. You know, you've got people making accusations every day trying to derive some financial benefit from it. So it is shocking that it could have gone on that long if it ever went on at all um, without somebody knowing. But um, I think we're going to find out. Uh, I don't know if we're going to find out in a week or a month or, or six months, but I, I, I think something's going to come of this. Um, it, it's the rarest of occasions where they execute warrants at this level and don't end up doing something about it. Um, so I think that, you know, um, Diddy's team is going to be poised for, uh, you know, charges to be to be leveled at some level at some point in time just how quickly it's hard to tell well again you you represent high profile people what would you be advising diddy right now if you were representing him yeah I, i'd be telling him hey listen you're innocent you haven't done anything wrong so act like you haven't done anything wrong live your life uh, you know keep your friends close and 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 keep your enemies away from you um walk like you're innocent talk like you're innocent Continue to do the things that you do every day. Um, try to get yourself invested in some good things. If you aren't already, I'm sure he's got a lot of charities, et cetera, that he's working on. You know, show yourself to be who we say you are. Um, and um, I think in that way, you don't make a bad situation, if it is a bad situation, even worse. So I think he's got to put a good face on and, and to make sure he lets the world know and ultimately his jury know that he's innocent. Um, and I, I would take an aggressive approach if I was them. Um, I really would, because this is a case that's going to garner an enormous amount of publicity. You're, you're talking to jurors with, with your actions. And so he wants to make those actions real and right. And, and I'm sure that that'll happen. I'm sure he's in the best of hands and they'll make sure that, um, he's sending a message loud and clear to any protect, particular jury pool that he's innocent of these charges and he looks forward to defending them now let's say he's not charged yet right uh would you i can't I, i'm not sure but he's being attacked on the pr machine i mean everybody is saying things about him right now I, and to give you an example so 50, 50 cent came out basically was trolling diddy a, a lot i know they have a feud he, he it's posted on instagram now it's not did he do it it's did he done they don't come like that unless they got a case it just got real the feds and all the cribs damn they got the kids in cuffs uh aubrey o'day who was part of danity kane that was uh you know a music group that was uh, uh started i believe by diddy she came out and said what you sow you shall reap i pray this emboldens all of us all of us victims to finally speak on what we have endured. Would you advise Diddy to make a statement personally, to whether it's an interview uh, in a media outlet, to order a statement of his own on social media to respond to this? Only if it's controlled. Um, I've seen disaster after disaster. We saw it in the Penn State case where people went on Dateline, the defendant went on Dateline and got interviewed. Um, I, it would have to be controlled. I think it would have to be brief. I think once you go down that road, you run into a lot of trouble. Um, keep in mind that the story here is a better story if he did it than if he didn't. And I've tried to be on the other side of that in, in cases. And you can see it go both ways. And, in, in, you know, in our case with Meek, obviously the, the media was, was rooting for him because it was right. It was just. In other cases I've had, they didn't care what the accused had to say. Uh, that's not the story for them. The story is is better if it's uh, if it's that he did it. And so I, I I think if he's going to make any kind of a statement at all, it'd be a prepared statement. It'd be a quick statement. Did he not take questions? And it'd be something probably as perfectly crafted as the response you saw from his lawyer. And that would be the end of it. Uh, taking interviews, I think, can be a disaster. One misstep during an interview, and it's a it's a news cycle for a month. <laughs> that you'll that you'll never uh, be able to overcome so um very limited in in terms of a response but perhaps a response uh that's measured uh and brief and let's say diddy is hit with these massive sex trafficking related charges and you were to represent him how do you defend him at trial again you've represented very high profile people cosby is some, a name that comes up in a very high profile case how, how would you represent him well i you know I, I i think it depends on what the evidence is if the evidence is allegations being made by individuals um you know you do it the old-fashioned way 
you 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 develop an investigation you find out everything that they've ever said about them any motives they would have to lie about them um, and you know one by one you try and dissect the allegations I don't think there's another way to do it um, you know sometimes you get real lucky in these cases somebody makes an allegation that you were somewhere at some place at some time and you weren't uh, these other individuals I'm sure are being interviewed in the media you want to get every single sound bite they've ever given everything they've ever said about the case and hold up those inconsistencies one against the other um, and more importantly if he's got evidence of innocence you know sometimes you sometimes you really you really do you've got an innocent client there uh, believe it or not nobody believes that and if this guy is innocent of these allegations or if they've been distorted in any way remember you know you prove one distortion and then all of a sudden the whole thing could collapse and so you know I'm sure what he's going to do and what his lawyers are going to do is they're going to dissect everything that's been alleged against them you know the nice thing about civil lawsuits is there's a lot of information you can glean from them there's depositions there's interrogatories and people are of record and so there's great fodder for cross-examination in these cases and I'm sure he's done a lot of wonderful things in his life and and those things are going to have to be brought to bear in a criminal courtroom you know let the world know how good he is and how good he's been so that that image can be created and you know remember in a criminal case you don't need to convince 12 you just got to convince one one of the things though i don't know if you had the opportunity to read the little rod jones lawsuit but embedded in that lawsuit were screenshots of what appears to be diddy with what appears to be underage girls at a party uh, there, Cuba Gooding Jr. is somebody who's been implicated in this. There's a picture of Little Rod Jones with Cuba Gooding Jr.'s arm around him. Um, there is, uh, they, he claims Little Rod Jones, he has other evidence. He even says that um, Diddy has cameras in his house of all of this purported sexual conduct as a form of blackmail. He seems he came forward in that lawsuit. And again, it's a different standard. It's a lawsuit. It's not a criminal case. But he seems to have... A, a, Enough to a lot to prove his allegations, and again, I wonder what that effect had on this case. Because when I was reading it three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I was like, "This is he's not just making out; he's got receipts in a way of it." And and I thought that was really substantial. I'm curious how that might be playing into the, this case. Well, I think it, it it it's everything about this case at this point. I think they went looking for receipts. I mean, you know, I I think you're right. I think there was enough allegations and specific allegations um, that, that suggested that there was proof in existence in places that they could find it. And that's what they went looking for. Um, I don't think, you know, these search warrants uh, were, were just to send a message. They were looking for stuff. And I, I think it was based on a lot of the allegations you've just suggested. The question is, did they find the receipts? Because when you say there's tapes and when you say there's evidence and the feds go looking for it and they don't find it, well, that's that's you know that's one more quiver, you know, in 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 our arsenal in terms of being able to defend these cases. So I don't think you're wrong. I I think you know they they were looking for the breadcrumbs um, and they were trying to find uh, the kind of real evidence that that the feds rely on when they indict somebody. Again, you, you know they're they're very careful. They're not going to go on somebody's allegations because of some picture. They're going to want to look at, you know, real evidence. What evidence do they have that people are being brought into the country? I mean, you've got Homeland Security here. So yeah. this wasn't an FBI sting, uh, an, F an FBI warrant. This was Homeland Security. So they're looking at, you know, international um, evidence. They're looking at flight evidence. They're looking at, you know, whatever kind of real evidence that doesn't lie, that can't be cross-examined in order to bring a, cro uh, you know, a credible prosecution and they won't come without it. Um, they're not going to come with, with he say, she say stuff in federal court. They never do. Um, and if they do come, then my guess is they're going to have to they're going to have to bring it with a lot of credible um, real evidence. And whether they found any, they may have. I mean, they probably got computers and they probably got, you know, every single piece of digital information they could get uh, to corroborate these allegations. But you're going to need corroboration or they won't come. What a case. What a case. What a development. Oh, yeah. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, and we will see yep. where it goes. It's an ever-developing story. Um, Brian J. McMonagall, really thank you so much for coming on, uh, talking about this, giving us a different perspective on it. Uh, we'll make sure to stay in touch as this definitely progresses.
Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. All right, everybody. That's all we have for you right now here on this episode of Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time. Hip-hop legend and media mogul Sean Diddy Combs has seemingly remained untouchable for years. And now the potential downfall of his empire and legacy has taken the hip-hop community by storm. But was the writing always on the wall for Diddy's alleged behavior? Several celebrities have casually spoken out about his so-called parties, which lawsuits have alleged to be breeding grounds for sex assault and trafficking. Clues of what was allegedly behind the curtain began to emerge in November when Diddy's former girlfriend Cassie Ventura sued the mogul in federal court on allegations of rape and a decade-long pattern of physical and sexual abuse. The singer, who was previously signed to Diddy's Bad Boy Records, claimed the rapper was controlling of every aspect of her life, including where she lived, what she wore, and even her medical records. The suit alleged several instances of abuse committed by Diddy, including battery, rape, and forcing her to have sex with male sex workers. The suit also claims Diddy used intimidation to control the R&B singer, including allegedly having someone blow up another rapper's car after Diddy learned he was interested in romantically pursuing Cassie when they were on a break period from their relationship. The suit also alleges Diddy became violent, beating Cassie multiple times each year. In one instance, Diddy allegedly pushed her into a car, then proceeded to kick her in the face repeatedly. And another claim an intoxicated Diddy allegedly gave Cassie a black eye after she tried to leave a hotel room. The hotel security camera footage captured the incident, but Diddy allegedly bought it off for $50,000. Those weren't the only instances of alleged intimidation. The suit claims Diddy dangled Cassie's friend over a 17-story balcony and asked her to carry a gun in her purse. According to the suit, Cassie never went to the police and tried to leave their relationship multiple times, but was too afraid. The suit stated several Bad Boy Records employees turned a blind eye to the physical abuse and beatings Cassie allegedly endured, but no one spoke out in fear of their boss. According to the suit, Diddy supplied Cassie with different drugs, including ecstasy and ketamine. The suit claimed Cassie suffered from memory loss from the constant substance abuse during her relationship with Diddy. The documents also say her MRI results were sent directly to Diddy. The suit was ultimately settled a day after it was filed for an undisclosed amount. When Diddy's Los Angeles and Miami homes were raided by Homeland Security this week, the singer's attorney released a statement saying, quote, we will always support law enforcement when it seeks to prosecute those that have violated the law. Hopefully this is the beginning of a process that will hold Mr. Combs responsible for his depraved conduct. It wasn't the only instance a former girlfriend of Diddy's came forward alleging instances of abuse. Diddy's ex-girlfriend Gina Hun said in a 2019 interview with controversial blogger Tasha Kay that Diddy allegedly stomped on her stomach and punched her in the head during one incident. Hun reportedly dated Diddy when he and Cassie were on and off. In the interview, she said she pleaded with Diddy to stop hitting her and said she couldn't breathe after he stomped on her stomach. Just like Cassie, she alleges Diddy was mentally, emotionally, and physically abusive during their time together and claimed Diddy would compare she and Cassie, saying Hun is the bad one and Cassie is the good one. Hun did not take legal action against Diddy. However, her interview resurfaced around the web when Cassie filed her lawsuit against Diddy. And after this week's raid, previous celebrities Celebrity interviews are also resurfacing and revealing more about Diddy's alleged conduct. In 2016, singer Usher, who had previously lived with Diddy when he was a teenager, told radio personality Howard Stern very curious things took place at Diddy's so-called puffy flavor camp. Usher, who was around 13 at the time, had moved to New York City and lived with Diddy, who was going by Puff Daddy, for a year. The idea to live with Diddy came from L.A. Reid, who was Usher's manager. Usher said he went to live with Diddy for a chance to see the lifestyle and referred to the time period as a wild and crazy time in the 90s. And in a 2004 interview with Rolling Stone, Usher was quoted as saying, Puff introduced me to a totally different set of stuff. 
sex specifically. Sex is so hot in the industry. There was always girls around. You'd open a door and see somebody doing it or several people in a room having an orgy. You never know what's going to happen. But in 2016, when Stern asked whether Puppy's place was filled with chicks and oraging nonstop, Usher responded, not really. It was curious and he got a chance to see things but didn't know if he could indulge and understand what he was even looking at. Usher said very curious things took place there that he didn't necessarily understand. As for if it would be a place Usher would consider sending his children to, this is what he had to say. 14 years old. You're a dad now. Would you ever send your kid to puffy camp? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Meanwhile, a member of a girl group previously founded and managed by Diddy also spoke out after Diddy's homes were raided by federal agents. On Monday, Aubrey O'Day, who was a part of the group Danity Kane, shared a statement about Combs after the raid saying, quote, what you sow, you shall reap. In December 2022, O'Day said she was fired from Danity Kane in 2008 because she wasn't willing to do what was expected of her, not talent-wise, but in other areas. She said she wasn't the only girl that was in those types of positions. This past September, Diddy announced his plans to reassign publishing rights to select Bad Boy Records artists, including O'Day's group Danity Kane. But O'Day claimed Diddy's deal came with strings attached, those strings being non-disclosure agreements, also known as NDAs, that the artist had to sign. O'Day said the NDA agreement included the artist would not disparage Puff, Bad Boy, Janice Combs, Diddy's mother, Justin Combs Music, EMI Publishing, or Sony ever in public. And despite Diddy presenting the music group Danity Kane with their publishing rights, O'Day said that doesn't equal more money for the group, saying the deal would only bring her less than $1,000 in royalties. Another former artist of Diddy also reacted to this week's raid of Diddy's homes. Rapper Mace called the raid big payback and said it was amazing it happened on the anniversary of Life After Death, which was the last album posthumously released by Diddy's best friend, Notorious B.I.G. Mace and Diddy have a long and embattled history. Mace was previously signed to Bad Boy Records in the 90s and the early 2000s. He gave his publishing rights to Diddy for $20,000. When he attempted to get his catalog back years later, he publicly slammed Diddy when the mogul turned down Mace's offer to buy back his publishing for $2 million. Diddy ultimately gave the publishing rights back to Mace. Mace, who had previously worked with Diddy on hits such as Can't Nobody Hold Me Down and Mo Money Mo Problems, before going on to have a successful solo career, said he escaped Diddy. During his podcast, which he hosts with fellow rapper Cameron, he seemingly referred to the serious allegations against Diddy, saying, everything now that we see playing out was all the things I escaped. Meanwhile, rapper 50 Cent taunted Diddy on Instagram after the feds raided his homes. The two have been feuding since the early 2000s. 50 Cent, whose real name is Curtis Jackson, wrote, quote, now it's not Diddy do it, it's Diddy done. They don't come like that unless they got a case. The beef between the two seemingly dates back to 2006 when 50 released a diss track called The Bomb, where he claimed Diddy knew who shot and killed Biggie in 97. Since then, the two have made numerous comments on each other. When Cassie sued Diddy in November, 50 Cent said his production company was working on a documentary about the sexual assault allegations against Combs. Even posting a clip to social media featuring bad boy rapper Mark Curry alleging Diddy spiked women's drinks at parties. The Diddy allegations also ventured into the comedy world, where comedian Cat Williams also previously made comments about Diddy's alleged wild parties. And January, Williams spoke out about Diddy during Shannon Sharp's Club Shay Shay podcast. Williams said, I gotta protect my integrity because if P. Diddy be wanting to party, and you gotta tell him no. And just weeks prior to the raid, music producer Rodney Jones Jr., also known as Lil Rod, filed a $30 million lawsuit against Diddy, alleging sexual harassment and threatening him for more than a year. According to the suit, Jones claims he was subjected to possible drugging and rape, ritual humiliation, and being cheated out of more than $50,000 for work on Diddy's album. The suit also names actor Cuba Gooding Jr. Jones believes Diddy was grooming him in an attempt to pass him off to Gooding, leaving the two alone in a studio on Diddy's yacht, where Gooding is alleged to have groped and fondled Jones when the two were left alone. Diddy has denied Jones's allegations against him. Diddy's lawyer released a statement calling the allegations outlandish and accused Jones of lying. The statement reads, quote, 
Lil Rod is nothing more than a liar who filed a $30 million lawsuit shamelessly looking for an undeserved payday. His reckless name dropping about events that are pure fiction and simply did not happen is nothing more than a transparent attempt to garner headlines. Lil Rod's attorney told Rolling Stone when Diddy's homes were raided, it's about damn time. Sometimes justice delayed is not justice denied so long as justice ultimately arrives. After Monday's raid, Diddy's lawyer issued a statement saying in part, quote, it was a gross overuse of military level force. There is no excuse for the excessive show of force and hostility exhibited by authorities or the way his children and employees were treated. Mr. Combs was never detained by, but spoke to and cooperated with authorities. There's no finding of criminal or civil liability with any of the allegations. Mr. Combs is innocent and will continue to fight every single day to clear his name. Reporting for Law and Crime, I'm Elizabeth Milner. He's rap royalty. What's up, New York? And the king of a seemingly bulletproof billion dollar empire. So Sean Diddy Combs faces losing it all. After a series of lawsuits accusing him of sexual misconduct, police this week raided two of his properties as part of a federal investigation into sex trafficking. The rapper's lawyers called it an ambush and a gross use of military level force. Ten years from now, we'll still be on top. Yo! Diddy says he'll fight to prove his innocence. But many are speculating that he's the thin end of a big wedge, even foreshadowing a Me Too moment for rap. Was he a misogynist? In a way, he's selfish. He's a very selfish individual. He wants the spotlight on him. It's very much a shock. It's something that I, I have a hard time believing. Did he always surround himself uh, with young people uh, that basically go out and do whatever uh, he asked them to do. Abusive relationships go both ways, but of course, when you're a man, you're always seen as the villain, even if a woman attacks you first. They did not need to come in guns blazing. Remember, even though he may be a billionaire, he also deserves a presumption of innocence. He's facing very serious allegations. Well, join me now to discuss all this with the DJ and digital media mogul, DJ Vlad, and Mark Curry, the former Bad Boy Records artist who walked, worked closely with Sean Diddy uh, Coombs. So welcome to both of you. Uh, DJ Vlad, uh, a lot of people have, have wondered for a while, since the Me Too uh, scandal first erupted with Harvey Weinstein and enveloped various industries, why rap and hip hop uh, pretty well emerged unscathed. Do you think that what's going on now with, with Diddy is indicative of a sea change moment for rap and hip hop? Well, I don't think hip-hop has gone unscathed. I mean, R. Kelly is essentially hip-hop. I mean, although he sings, but he is overlapping with hip-hop. So this has been happening in hip-hop for a while. Uh, you're seeing it happen happening with Russell Simmons. Uh, so yeah, hip-hop has not been free and clear of this, uh, something that everyone's had to deal with. What do you make of what's happening with Diddy? I mean, it's hard to say. He hasn't been charged with anything. I mean, it looks bad. I mean, social media is having a field day. They're calling him the diddler. And uh, they're saying no Diddy whenever they say something questionable. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's not really up to social media or the public. It's really up to the authorities. And unlike an R. Kelly, Puffy has hundreds of millions of dollars and he's going to be able to get the absolute best defense. And, you know, ultimately, we'll see what happens in the courtroom. Mark Curry, you worked at Bad Boy Records. You know Diddy well, uh, worked with mm -hmm. him for him. Are you surprised by the revelations and by the FBI involvement? Mm -hmm. Uh, to me, it, it took me by shock because um, it's it's almost like karma. It's almost like what 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 he's been doing. A lot of people accuse him of putting them through in life is actually he is his time to um honestly have to go through the same things. So during those tribulations, what we had to learn was to just stay and fight and just do what you got to do. And so if he has the fight in him, like Velaz says. Then you know we're going to say that he's guilty until he's proven guilt. I mean, he's innocent until proven guilty, and we let the justice system do what they have to do because it's people that's in place that that get paid to actually investigate these things. So um, it's a it was a shock, but it's a very it's very much a shock. It's something that I I have a hard time believing in. What was he like to be around when you were working with him? 
you know, it's, it's his way of the highway, you know, very controlling. It is, um, he's a strong headed person. Um, you know, it's cool working with him, but it's, it's, it's doesn't create, it doesn't create, you know, like working with him and being famous with him and not having everything to go to, to along with the show is this the thing. So, um, he's, he's selfish. He's a very selfish individual. He wants the spotlight on him. He wants to be a rapper. So really, he's a rapper and not a business. He want, he, biz, Bad Boy is a business. It's a label. <clears throat> so he's a rapper on the label. So he's not just a label. He's a rapper. So it's, it's Russell Simmons is not a rapper. Or you don't... Um, um, so, you know, it's just one of those kind of situations there, you know. Was he, um, from your experience, was he a misogynist? He, in a way. And before we do, let me ask you this. Can we break that word down right fast one mm. time? So I want everybody to understand what that word is. You ask a question. A misogynist? What is it? Misogynist, yeah. Okay, explain that word for me, please. Well, misogyny is where a man would uh, be instinctively, inherently hateful towards a woman because she's a woman. Uh, and a lot of people feel a lot of uh, lyrics in rap music and rappers over the years have been brazenly mm -hmm. misogynist because actually a lot of their fan base like them to be. Uh, w w yes, you, you know, when you can say something like that, um, when you think about being famous and then you think about a female, sometimes a female can get the same energy that you get from being famous just by having her, her sexual organs. So... Yes, you, you have men that come in competition with women over their souls. So, yes, getting into a woman's soul is definitely an accomplishment for a lot of people to say, hey, the females like me, I'm famous and I'm handsome, whatever. And then you get to enjoy those things with females. So, yes, it's just something that comes with being a male, I think, and pursuing females. But I guess my point about uh, Diddy was, from your experience, did he treat women with respect or with disrespect? No one gets really the respect. It's hard to get respect from someone who's is on that level of such as the level that he's on. Um, it's, to get respect is something that they call you have to earn the respect. So you, in order to get that respect, you have to stand down on it and you have to earn that respect. He doesn't give respect, not to females, not to a lot of men, not to producers, um, friends. Um, you can just tell by the way that everyone that's around him and what's going on in their lives. You have all of the artists that's been in prison, a lot of artists that are dead. So it's like, what, if, what has he done to help those people's families? And then when you look at that, that's what I would call respect. DJ Vlad... DJ, I just wanted to talk about the sort of bigger <clears throat> picture here. You know, Sean Coombs is one of the most successful music artist business people uh, in the music business we've ever seen. I mean, he's, he's a billionaire uh, from a variety of different strands uh, coming off his music. Uh, he's, you know, for many people, I think he's a genius when it comes to both making music and for the business of, of, of music. Um, and we, we live in an era where, because of social media, it, it's very hard. When you get into the eye of a storm like this, it's very hard for him, a man we've just heard uh, so compellingly from Mark Curry there, likes to be in control. Uh, you, you suddenly feel like you're losing control, and it's quite hard to control any narrative, and it's quite hard to keep that narrative fair. You know, we all want to believe in innocent till proven guilty, but it's almost impossible, isn't it, with social media? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, you're going to get judged one way or another. But then again, uh, there's always just the news cycle of it all. If you look at last year, Kanye was getting canceled by everybody. Uh, he had lost a billion-dollar deal with Adidas, uh, every major corporation from Universal to even the, the hardware company he was working with to release his music dropped him. Uh, and now, look, he has the number one song in the country. Right, I mean, that's just undeniable. The number one song in the country is Kanye West mm -hmm. featuring Ty Dollar Sign, Carnival. So, and that was put out independently. So it just kind of shows that people have a short memory 
And if you put out something that people enjoy, they'll forget and forgive and just enjoy whatever art that you have. Just like, for example, Travis Scott, you know, when the whole, uh, mm. you know, uh, concert happened and the kids died, his album was put on hold, Nike delayed his sneaker, everything else like that. A year later, he put out his album once again and went number one, huge concert, huge merch, uh, everything else like that. People have a short memory. So it's really going to be what ultimately happens. And the only way he could really get canceled is if he gets put in prison like R. Kelly. Mark, where does he rank, Sean Coombs? Purely on talent, where does he rank? Um, purely on talent, I think he comes in probably around a six mm. on a scale from one to 10. He's not talented because he's he's not much of a great creator. You know, um, he's a great spokesperson or a person to just be in the place of a thing, but not great uh, as far as talent is concerned. And, you know, um, I wanted to reiterate one thing that I, I, you just was talking about. And we're talking about this system that's called the black ball system, where what happens is if you don't agree with someone like Puff, then you're up against a big system that won't like, for an example, when I first released the book in 2009, it was very difficult for me to get an interview on my own radio stations here in Atlanta because they said that he was spending so much money on marketing and promoting Ciroc and his liquors and his brands. So they was like, it would be, um, we would, we, we, it would be a conflict of interest. Mm. So it's a lot of people who are in positions such as Vlad. Um, Vlad, I'm glad to be on this platform with you today, but I've always been waiting for you to reach out to me to say, Mark, let's do an interview. I've done one with Sean Prez, but I was waiting on you. And it's those kind of things that we put in place that prevent from us spreading this information, we have to know how to not do that. So a lot of the things that I see in that system, I see within you and I as well, or you and other uh, platforms as well. And that's just something that we need to change. We should also stand by Puff during these times. We're not going to hold him accountable or guilty or say he's guilty until he's been proven guilty. And I think that social media has a very powerful play on the outcome of the situation. And if the situation comes out wrong and it's on the behalf of the social media's um, fault, then how do we address that? Because we, we should not let him go down just for what we think. Well, yeah. That's just my no, no, I think that's an opinion many people share. It's an ongoing problem. We see it time and again. Uh, Mark Curry, thank you very much indeed for joining us. We're going to be yes. joined now by someone who might be able to answer some of the, the more legal questions. Mark Garagos, he's joining us in a moment. Vlad, just a reaction uh, to, to what Mark was saying there. It comes back again to the innocent till proven guilty being so hard in the modern era that we're in. If you were advising Sean Coombs, what would you advise him to be doing right now? Uh, I think the best thing to do is just stay quiet and let the lawyers do their job. Uh, I think trying to interject and, and defend yourself in any type of way uh, usually just backfires. So let the lawyers do their job. He has the budget for the best lawyers in the country, and they're going to fight vehemently uh, on his behalf. So ultimately, if he just stays quiet and lets things happen, the uproar will start to die down. I remember the uproar over the whole Cassie lawsuit when he uh, settled right away. It was just insane. But then, you know, over time, people kind of started to forget about it a little bit, and then this happened again. But ultimately, it's going to be up to him. Uh, he's still going to be rich. He still has a huge catalog. Um, I actually disagree with Mark Curry. I think that Puffy uh, is extremely talented. Uh, to be able to take someone like a Biggie, who was just an underground rapper, is overweight and has a lazy eye and to turn him into a superstar and to be able to do this with artist after artist, decade after decade, that's a huge talent. Uh, just like a Quincy Jones. Uh, Quincy may not have played all the instruments on Michael Jackson's Thriller, but look what he helped put together. Right. So, yeah, that's my disagreement with Mark. Well, I agree with you. And actually, I've, I've met Diddy a few times. I've got to say, he was always extremely courteous and respectful when I met him. And I was quite surprised about yeah. how... Uh, critical Mark Curry was really about him as a person, basically implying he's disrespectful to everybody, he's a control freak, um, etc. I mean, that's, it was quite a critical picture he painted there. Let me bring in Mark Garagos, who's one of the top criminal defence lawyers in Hollywood. Uh, Mark, great to see you again. Um, where are we with, with this case? FBI now made a move on Sean Diddy Coombs. How significant is that? And why do you think they've chosen now? Well, I think that they, they're using, if you will, 
the civil lawsuits, and when I say they, I'm talking about the Department of Justice and specifically the Southern District of New York. They're using those as kind of a roadmap. And this was, frankly, a, a very uh, a daring move by them and a very quick move. Normally, with the feds, it's uh, they move at a glacial pace. This has been at warp speed. And I think this is sending a message to potential witnesses that they better cooperate now or it's going to get dangerous. I, I would believe that there are a number of people who are in the crosshairs, and that's the way the feds operate. So this is serious business. And for those who've not been following the detail of this case, what, what are we talking about here? What is the crux of the case against him? And what is the potential jeopardy for Diddy in this? Well, by reverse engineering it, you've got the Department of Homeland Security as apparently the lead agency here. If that's the case, then the allegations that are in the civil lawsuits that talk about trafficking and things of that nature are probably front and center. And I say that because it looks to me at least based on, and I'm piecing it together, uh, based on what I've seen, it looks like that's what they're running to ground to make sure that, that if that's what's happening, that they've explored it and at least have given witnesses an opportunity to respond. It really is a somewhat over the top in some sense, because I don't think that at any point he was going to flee or do anything else. They did not need to come in guns blazing, so to speak. I know that there's allegations of guns and drugs and things like that. But to give you a perfect example, yesterday they were reporting that they had arrested somebody at the airport. He was fleeing in a private jet, all of that stuff that was coming out. My understanding is, is that he was planning on going on spring break with his daughters. And so that's why the airplane was uh, there. And that the gentleman who was arrested and variously described as a mule, so to speak, it was nothing more than allegedly personal use. So before we get all overheated. Let's try and put it in context. And remember, even though he may be a billionaire, he also deserves a presumption of innocence. Yeah, and in fact, just before you joined us, we were talking about the problem of social media and how difficult it is to, to control stories like this when conspiracy theories run wild, whether it's to do with Diddy now or whether last week it was uh, the Princess of Wales and what was wrong with her and so on. Um, and that brings me to an odd part of this story, uh, Mark, which is Prince Harry being named in the lawsuit um, because apparently Coombs is said to have drawn guests, it says, to his infamous parties through VIP associations with celebrities like famous athletes, political figures, artists, musicians and international dig dignitaries like British royal Prince Harry. Uh, that's got a lot of attention, a lot of headlines. Uh, what's the purpose of them including Prince Harry in that way, do you think? I think it was clearly because they wanted to try to titillate. I mean, look, the, anybody who knows Sean knows he's been throwing a white party for as long as I can remember. I've actually attended the white party and met a number of people there. There was nothing untoward going on at the parties themselves. Um, he's done them in L.A. He's done them in the Hamptons. Uh, there is, uh, you know, they... Part of what is hard to reconcile here is some of these uh, wild and frankly outlandish allegations with what you actually have as evidence or no. And I've been around and, and in full disclosure, I've represented him on multiple occasions and I haven't seen anything that would suggest kind of the titillation or the um, outlandish kinds of allegations that I've seen floating around. But Pierce, you make a great point. Uh, 10 days ago, we were seeing some of the most outrageous things about the, the princess being floated around on social media, and it turns out all of those were dead wrong. I can't tell you how often I see that with clients and situations I'm involved in. I mean, Prince Harry's front page of a few newspapers uh, over here in the UK. Uh, if you were him, how would you be feeling about being dragged into this on such what appears to be such a spurious context? Well, when you see the one of the lawsuits that was filed where they compare one of uh, 
uh, Diddy's employees to the version of Jelaine Maxwell. So they're they're trying to draw that. And then if you throw in Prince Harry, then you get the reminiscent of Andrew with Epstein. So I understand what's being done. It's a very creative use of the uh, the legal process in order to draw the attention. And to some extent, it has worked so far because you now have the feds going full bore in his direction. DJ Vlad, talking about Diddy's circle, the people around him, he's obviously very rich, very successful. Um, what kind of team does he has, to, to your knowledge? Um, I mean, Diddy's always surround himself uh, with young people uh, that basically go out and do whatever uh, he asked them to do. I remember when I was on Drink Champs uh, recently, I talked about an incident uh, years and years ago where we were at a club and Diddy was there as, as well as me. And a guy that was working with Diddy approached me and said that Diddy really liked my jacket and asked if he could buy it off me. <laughs> you know, I said, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> but, but that was Are you that's the type of things that he uh, has people Vlad, do. Vlad, you wearing it now? No, I'm not wearing it now. <laughs> I don't have the jacket anymore. Well, I do like that jacket, so I'm just asking if it's available. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I dress nice. <laughs> but, yeah, no, Diddy offered it. He said, hey, you know, Diddy loves the jacket. He's asking if you want to sell it to him right now. And I remember it was like winter outside, and I said, ah, no, thank you, man. No, thank you probably could have got a good price in that moment. Uh, maybe, maybe. But I think just taking off my jacket and selling it to another man right then and there just felt a little too weird for me. But what is your sense about what kind of person he is now, Diddy? Now he's made his money, made his wealth, made his fame, made his fortune. Has he changed from what you hear? Is he still the same guy? You know, again, I come back to what Mark Curry was, was saying, painting quite a critical picture of this guy, you know, a control freak, disrespectful, treated everybody pretty much as lesser individuals. Is that your sense of Diddy? And is that what you hear about him? Well, I don't really know Diddy. I interviewed him 10 years ago when he was first launching Revolt. Uh, I ran into him here and there. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, people are going to be people. I remember I had a conversation with Roger Bonds, who used to be his security guy, and we were talking about the whole allegations uh, of abuse with Cassie. And what he said, what he personally saw, was that he'd be in the car with both of them, and then suddenly Cassie would punch Diddy in the face. And then Diddy would jump back there, and they would start scuffling and everything else like that. So... You know, I mean, he's going to have messed up relationships just like the rest of us. Uh, abuse, abusive relationships go both ways. But, of course, when you're a man, you're always seen as the villain, even if a woman attacks you first. Uh, you know, you see what's, you know, 15 years later, Chris Brown still can't perform at NBA uh, celebrity games because of the whole Rihanna story. So it's one of those things. Uh, I think ultimately he has calmed down quite a bit and he has mellowed out and so forth. But I think men are going to be men and people are going to be people. And if pushed to a certain direction, people are going to react how they're going to react. Mark Garagos, you, you've acted for him. Um, what kind of person did you find him to be? Look, he is intense and he is uh, hard driving. But you can say that, Pearson. In fact, I was watching a little bit about... Uh, one of the other people that you've talked about, I mean, that, that goes with the territory. I mean, you know, people who are uh, successful share a lot of the common traits. One of the things that you know, the picture that is being painted is not something that I have seen uh, or experienced. And I've spent hours and hours over years um, uh, representing him on various things and just haven't seen it. I mean, you know, it's almost a caricature. Also, and to your question, uh, the people that he has surrounds himself with, I've, I've known, met, and, uh, and consider many of the people around him um, uh, quality, high, uh, the highest quality uh, people. I, 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 I won't mention their names for fear of having uh, them get into the crosshairs, but I can think of two or three off the top of my head who I just uh, think the world of. So I'm not so sure that the picture that is being painted has any relationship whatsoever to the reality here. I understand that we live in an era where it is, you know, you mentioned Chris Brown and I represented Chris Brown in that, in that incident with Rihanna and Rihanna quickly 
uh, for those who don't remember, actually came to court to support Chris during those proceedings. I was there. She was at my office. We went to court. And, you know, there's there's a forgiveness in the personal relationships that somehow doesn't seem to kind of spill over into other situations. And in Diddy's case, the some of the things that I've heard are just so over the top and bear no connection to the things that I've seen personally that it's hard to it's hard to reconcile. If he is convicted of these kind of offenses, sex trafficking and so on, they're obviously very serious. You know, what kind of jail time could he be looking at? Look, the the I always hesitate to speculate on things like that. My, I, I remember a client once, I, uh, when my father was alive, he was my partner, and the client asked him, how much time could I do? And he told her, and she came running into my office, your daddy scare me. And, uh, you know, I don't want to answer honestly. He hasn't been filed on. I fully expect, based on what I've heard so far, that, we're, that we aren't uh, close to any kind of a filing. So I'm not going to speculate because generally in these kinds of cases the prosecutor holds all the cards i mean that's one of the, the the i guess the beauties and the detriments of the criminal justice system federally in america is that the prosecutor can stack charges in such a way that you could be you can go away for the rest of your life it's a daunting amount of responsibility that a prosecutor has and you always hope that they're going to exercise that responsibility in a way that they're not going to uh, over overshoot the mark, so to speak. He's facing very serious allegations. He's facing incredibly um, serious, um, kind of daunting, if you will, charges if they end up being filed. As of right now, the allegations are what are contained in a search warrant that is probable cause. Probable cause, I've joked before, I think actually with you, Piers, many years ago, uh, that it's devolved to the point where I just say, is my client breathing for right. probable cause? Right. So we're not at a, at a situation where somebody has been post a probable cause proceeding where you've been able to test the witnesses and the evidence. So I would tell everybody, take a deep breath. Let's see how it unfolds. Yeah. Mark Garagos, as always, brilliant analysis there. And DJ Vlake, great to have you back in on Sensor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me.